I'm MC Owens, and this is going to be one of my visual presentations on something Buddhist. Um, and so actually, if you have seen or you know of the two presentations I gave uh, before this, one is called Visions of the Buddha, which is about the iconography of the Buddhist image or the image of the Buddha, I should say. And the other talk I gave, <clears throat> excuse me, is called the Land of the Buddhas, which is actually more about the image of the Buddha, but in different countries or different regions and sort of looking at the, the variations of the image of the Buddha. So this is going to be a follow up in a way to those two talks. Um, in, in other words, there's a lot of background information, geography, history that I'm not going to cover tonight that's covered in those two talks. So tonight is just a talk about the image of the Bodhisattva. I call this talk uh, Being of Awakening, which would be a way to translate Bodhisattva. Um, Tonight, the basic idea of tonight, this is a talk I've wanted to give for a while. It's, uh, it's about the image of the bodhisattva, uh, meaning the, the actual pictures, like depictions of bodhisattvas. But I also, part of this talk is about the idea of a bodhisattva. Like, the, like there's a Buddha and there's a bodhisattva. What's a bodhisattva? So tonight is sort of very much about bodhisattvas, not just the image, but the very idea of a bodhisattva. But as usual, I will use my map, but of course we get rid of all of those nation state countries, right? And in fact, I even like to get rid of national <laughs> boundaries and borders. We're dealing strictly with top topography, right? Strictly with geography in that, in that sense. Um, and we will deal with time. Time's a tricky one to abandon entirely. And so I do use the conventional dating system, right? Um, of course, this is for convenience. And the general time frame which we, this begins, this story begins, of course, is around the fourth or the fifth century BC. And we are in this general region of India. And we are in a place called Magadha, which is today the Nalanda district of India. So I always like to start with this image just so that we are fully in mind of the, you know, how old this tradition is, also, if you aren't aware uh, where this tradition comes from, right? This is not a, a, originally, this is not a Chinese tradition, a Japanese tradition, a Mongolian tradition. This is originally sort of from what is today called India from around 2,500 years ago. And so the name of this talk is Being of Awakening the image of the Bodhisattva in Mahayana Buddhism. And this is, it's called that, meaning that we are strictly dealing with the idea of the Bodhisattva in Mahayana Buddhism, because there is the idea of a Bodhisattva in all forms of Buddhism, not just, Mah Mah not just Mahayana Buddhism. So in other words, this idea of the bodhisattva, the being of enlightenment or the being of awakening, it indeed, it goes back to the very origins of Buddhism, right? So we are back to the beginning. But in the early days of Buddhism, the word bodhisattva referred to more or less one thing and one thing only. And so I'm going to start with a image. This is certainly not from 500 BC India. This particular image is probably, it's, it's Indian. It's Gupta, Gupta period. It's probably from around the fourth or the fifth century AD. So 
almost a thousand years since the Buddha lived and died in that sense. But I want to start with this image to show you or talk about what the Bodhisattva, what that word originally referred to in Buddhism. So originally the word Bodhisattva referred to, well, or it didn't refer to this, but it could be associated with something called the, the Lalita Vistara, the play. In fact, it, actually that means the full play. In other words, what we're talking about with this word Bodhisattva, Bodhi means awakening, Sattva is a being, and so a, a creature, if you will, a sattva, a being, but not, a, you know, not a normal being, not a regular old flesh and blood necessarily being in that way. We are talking about a being of enlightenment, a bodhisattva. And this term originally referred to the life of the Buddha before he was the Buddha. That's what the word bodhisattva originally referred to. So for all intents and purposes, there was only one bodhisattva originally. And this image, this uh, it's called a stele, uh, a freestanding monument. This is a great representation of the Lalita Vistara, the play in full. And what does that mean, the play? the great play, the great performance. Well, I'm going to help you out. If you look at this image here on the screen, it all begins at the bottom, actually, with the birth. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this exactly, but this is an image of the mother of the Buddha birthing the Buddha out of her right side. So you can see a... a um, uh, um, a woman catching the baby coming out of the side. And this is the birth of the, the bodhisattva, the birth of the being who is bound for enlightenment. This is a great stele because if you go up one, this is actually the depiction of the great renunciation. So this is the Buddha going, or I shouldn't say the Buddha, this is Siddhartha, the bodhisattva, going off into the woods. And this middle section is also the awakening, which is the defeat of Mara, the defeat of death, basically, the overcoming of death. And at this point in the story, at this point in the Lalita Vistara, the Bodhisattva ceases to be the enlightenment seeker ceases being the being headed towards awakening and actually becomes the Buddha, the being of awakening. And that's what the term Bodhisattva originally meant. The life of the being who was bound for awakening, bound to become the Buddha. And after this being becomes the Buddha, they then go on to their 45 years of teaching this is the turning, the Dharma Chakra Mudra, turning the wheel of the Dharma. And then finally, right up at top, we have the Nirvana or the, what is technically the Pari Nirvana, the final complete blowing out. So there you have it. Birth, renunciation, enlightenment, Nirvana. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, the life story of the Buddha. And that's the story of the Bodhisattva. At least that was the story of the Bodhisattva in its original sense. Now I want to kind of recontextualize ourselves. So that was the story of the Buddha that supposedly took place in around 500 BC. <clears throat> but if we move ahead, you, you know this story. If you watch my other talks, you know Buddhism spread outside of that original Magadha area. And as we move forward in time, Buddhism spreads and starts to kind of diversify into a few different traditions or 
you could call them sects or schools. These sects and schools start splitting off. And what I want to kind of get us to is I want to get us to about this period, right around the year zero. So you'll notice I've skipped a lot of time. Uh, the southern form of Buddhism goes down to Sri Lanka. There's a type of Buddhism that takes up in Nepal. There's a type of Buddhism that spreads to what is today Pakistan. There's even a form of Buddhism that spreads to what is today Afghanistan. So around the year zero or so, this is the extent of the Buddhist world. And the color sort of represents some general differences in different types of Buddhism. But, you know, for the most part, all of these types of Buddhism were more or less the same in practice and even in their philosophy or their dharma in that sense. But somewhere, somewhere between around the year 300 BC and the year zero. So somewhere in that 300 year period, and I don't wanna make it sound like this happened overnight. It probably happened over that 300 year period you get the rise of what is called the Mahayana or the Mahayana, right? The great vehicle. So this is in contrast to that earlier form of Buddhism, what would be called Abhidharma Buddhism or Nikaya Buddhism. That early Buddhist period has a lot of different names. But this evening, we're going to be talking about the image of the Bodhisattva in the Mahayana tradition right? That's the name of this talk. So this is not about the Bodhisattva in its entirety, but just the Mahayana vision or idea of the Bodhisattva. So the Mahayana is this term, it means the great vehicle. And, you know, I've given a lot of other talks <clears throat> that sort of talk about this idea, but this is a new you know, it's not really so different, but it's a more less monastic, more socially engaged form of Buddhism. And in the Mahayana tradition, you should know that, you know, this term Mahayana is, um, it doesn't really refer to anything specifically. What I mean is it's a general term for a general way of being Buddhist. And in the early days, in, the, in that kind of like 400 BC, 300 BC, 200 BC era, Mahayana Buddhism was also referred to as Bodhisattva Yana Buddhism, the way of the Bodhisattva. And that has to do with the fact that Mahayana Buddhism is entirely about the Bodhisattva path. But what does this mean? What does this mean in reference to our original understanding of the Bodhisattva as just a term for the Buddha before he was the Buddha? What does this mean? Well, I got to tell you that what I'm, what I'm, well, let me bring it up. This particular rubric here that I'm about to talk about, these are three different ways of thinking about bodhisattvas in the Mahayana. And I want to tell you right away that this is like, you know, cutting edge Buddhist scholarship. And what I mean is, is that the early history of Mahayana Buddhism has yet to be written. The early history of the Bodhisattva has yet to be written. There are scholars today hard at work putting together PhD dissertations and whatnot that are piecing together the early history of the Bodhisattva, the early history of Mahayana. And so what I'm presenting is the current state of the field of study. So I want you to know that this is still unfolding, right? So I'm like a journalist here tonight, just telling you about what's going on in the current state of the field. 
And so these three terms, forest bodhisattvas and sutra bodhisattvas and iconic bodhisattvas, you will not find the, this terminology anywhere but here. In fact, I made it up a few hours ago trying to figure out how to present these ideas. And so it would seem if you read all the dissertations and you read all the books, we can kind of talk about these three different kinds of bodhisattvas. Let's talk about the first, what are called forest bodhisattvas, right? So forest bodhisattvas is a term, and I'm kind of borrowing this term, by the way, and I'll show you the source for this in a second. But I want you to know that it does seem that the origin of the, the Mahayana, the origin of the Mahayana bodhisattva, well, it was in this interesting uh, social movement within Buddhism. It was a seemingly, again, just drawing on the information, it was seemingly a kind of anti-establishment, anti-hierarchical form of Buddhism. And so these forest bodhisattvas were seemingly real people who sort of moved away from the established monastic hierarchical institutions of Buddhism and in a way seemingly made it their goal to become Buddhas. Not just followers of a Buddha, not just followers of the teachings of a Buddha, but to actually step, move in the footsteps of the Buddha and become a Buddha themselves. This is sort of the shift that happens in Mahayana Buddhism. The shift is, there's a, there's a lot of changes for this evening. One of the shifts is, is that the Lalita Vistara, the great play, right, that I told you about a moment ago, the life story of the Buddha from birth, renunciation, enlightenment, and nirvana, that story, it becomes not the mythology or the life story of our founder. It becomes an archetypal journey towards enlightenment. And that's a very interesting shift in the Mahayana, where we move from revering the great guru, the great teacher. So we move from that position of worshiping the teacher to mimicking the teacher in that way. So that's very much a part of this forest bodhisattva tradition. It seemingly was uh, some folks, both uh, male and female, by the way, because this tradition was very against the sexism of the hierarchical Buddhist tradition, seemingly. And so this was sort of a very, a, a new path for Buddhism. And the forest bodhisattva tradition was based upon the practice of the paramitas, which are kind of a new idea in Mahayana Buddhism. These ideas of giving, moral discipline, patience, drive, meditation, and wisdom, those are not new ideas to Buddhism, but putting them in this sort of uh, framework of the paramitas, this is very much a Mahayana Buddhist idea, that these are the practices of the bodhisattva, the paramitas, as well as something called the the um, the four samgraha, the four means of unification, also generosity, but also including kind speech, volunteerism and cooperation. By the way, the means of unification or the samgraha, this is very much sort of what um, what people are thinking of when they talk about socially engaged Buddhism, 
socially engaged Buddhism, although that is a kind of a neologism or kind of a new term, it's actually a very old idea, which is a type of Buddhism that is very much about social engagement. That has a lot to do with these four means of unification. These forest dwelling bodhisattvas were also in the business of performing siddhis or wonders, uh, miracles, magic, if you will, but doing it as a form of upaya or skillful means. So a, a, a means of, of uh, teaching the Dharma in that sense. And these forest dwelling bodhisattvas also seem to have been involved in some very intense samadhi practice or concentration practice, meditation, but deep states of meditation that were actually based upon visualizations of Buddhas. And that, I mean, there's a lot more I could add to this list, but I think those four things in particular really kind of encompass the bodhisattva path. And what I'm getting at is, is that the idea of a bodhisattva, it's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky to like, just say what it is. Because on the one hand, it's a form of practice. It's a form of Buddhist practice that involves those four things on the board and much more. And I want you to know that these Mahayana bodhisattvas were seemingly, at least some of them, quote, real people, real forest dwelling saints, if you want to call them that, or something like that. So you need to know about that. But then I also, oh, by the way, these are three great sources of what I just said was the cutting edge of Buddhist scholarship. So Daniel Boucher's book, Bodhisattvas of the Forest and the Formation of the Mahayana, that pretty much <laughs> says it all. That's a great source of information. Paul Harrison, who's at Stanford University, he's a great source of information. This is one of his collections of essays. And Jan Natier is also a, an amazing Buddhist scholar who writes on this early Mahayana tradition. So these are three scholars and three books, by the way, that if you're interested in this early forest dwelling bodhisattva tradition, these are great sources for that. Otherwise, I want to move to the next way of thinking about bodhisattvas in the Mahayana. These are what I call sutra bodhisattvas. So these are these kind of characters that appear in these new Mahayana sutras. So you may know that early Buddhism is based upon what are called what's called the Pali Canon, the original teachings of the Buddha preserved in the Pali language. But in Sanskrit and other languages, there appeared these new sutras. And these sutras weren't like the old sutras because they weren't just these like teachings, these like recorded sayings of the Buddha. These Mahayana, these great vehicle sutras, they're much more in the form of stories and narratives. They do not even present themselves as like the recorded teachings of the Buddha. They present themselves as stories. And bodhisattvas appear in those stories as characters. Because of the amount of bodhisattvas that appear in these sutras, it starts to become a little obvious that they are in the story as a character, but it might be that the meaning of their name or even the very sound of their name it, it may be that that is the bodhisattva. They're not referring to people. They're not referring even to gods or anything like that. That it is literally the very word and its meaning that is the bodhisattva. 
And that's kind of a subtle idea, but I just want you to be aware of that, that these bodhisattvas may, at least these sutra bodhisattvas, they may just be this very sound and idea that's being presented in that way. In terms of these Mahayana sutras, bodhisattvas also serve the function of being a part of what I call a trilectical conversation. So not a dialectical that involves two people, like your classic uh, platonic dialogue of Plato, where it's two people dialoguing. Buddhist or Mahayana sutras actually have an interesting trilectical thing going on, where there's the Buddha, there's a bodhisattva, and then there's a shravaka or a monk who sort of represents and kind of always represents the early Buddhist tradition. The Bodhisattva represents this new Mahayana tradition. And there's a, a kind of a dialogue going on between those two mediated by the Buddha. And it creates a, actually a third uh, level to Mahayana discourse. And so I want you to know that in terms of these Bodhisattvas being uh, narrative figures, they serve that role in the sutras. All right. The third type of, oh, sorry, sorry. Here's a good example of the sutra bodhisattvas. So this is the opening of the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, a classic Mahayana Sutra. And here you can see the very, and these are the translated names of the sutras, or sorry, names of the bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas like equivalent contemplation, inequivalent contemplation, equivalent and inequivalent contemplation. So all if you can read through these, these bodhisattvas have some really wild names. And it may be that the name, again, is the bodhisattva itself, like the very idea of it. And this gives you an idea of, if you've never read a Mahayana Sutra, this gives you an idea of how they read. And so one of the things I wanna say right away though, is that it's possible, it's possible when you read a Mahayana Sutra, it's possible that these are the names of actual forest dwelling bodhisattvas. So in other words, I'm kind of mashing the two together the forest bodhisattva and the sutra bodhisattva, it may be that they're the same thing. It may be that the sutras are stories about the forest dwelling bodhisattvas. We don't know. That's what I'm here to tell you. We don't know. The, the history has yet to be written. So I just want you to know that we're not exactly sure what the sutra bodhisattvas refer to, if they refer to real people, if they refer to just names, how it's working. So just want you to be aware of that. And now we move to the third type of bodhisattva. This bodhisattva I call the iconic bodhisattva. And what's funny is, is I was, you know, hours ago, I was putting this talk together and I was thinking, you know, what am I gonna call this third category? And the idea occurred to me, iconic. Yes, they're truly iconic, right? But wait a minute. What does that word really mean? So I check my etymological dictionary, the Oxford Etymological Dictionary, and we find this word icon, this English word icon, goes all the way back to the 1570s, and it means an image, a figure, a picture, or a statue. That is exactly what I'm talking about with these bodhisattvas. But also this word comes from this Latin term, which comes from this Greek term, akon, which means likeness, image or portrait, image in a mirror. Now I, I, now I really like this uh, definition. I, I really, you know, this is, is nailing it in terms of what I mean a semblance, a phantom image, right? An image in the mind, it couldn't get any better. So iconic bodhisattvas, I'm sticking with it. And by the way, 
even in terms of these iconic bodhisattvas, the ones that have images, that have attributes, there are so many <laughs> that it was difficult to whittle this down. Um, you know, it being eight o'clock, I'm already glad I only chose four, right? Um, so I chose these four iconic bodhisattvas. I need you to know, I want you to know there are many more. But I felt like if you knew about these four, you'd be on pretty solid ground for moving forward. So the four bodhisattvas we're going to talk about tonight are Avilokiteshvara, Manjushri, Kashidigarbha, and Samantabhadra. Those are their Sanskrit names. Only right here am I going to reduce these bodhisattvas to the idea that Avilokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of compassion, Manjushri, the bodhisattva of wisdom. Kshidigarbha is usually the bodhisattva of the great vow, but is also associated with Kshanti or patience. And Samantabhadra is the bodhisattva of meditation, but is also the bodhisattva of the initial determination for enlightenment. But I'm actually not crazy about the idea of reducing these bodhisattvas to these one ideas. So this is kind of common to do this, especially with someone like Avilokiteshvara to refer to them as the bodhisattva of compassion. So I wanted you to know that, that these bodhisattvas, these iconic bodhisattvas, they do come to represent certain qualities or certain aspects of Buddhism. But I actually think it would, it would be a shame to just reduce them down to that one idea. So that's the last you'll kind of hear of such reductionism tonight. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to take these one by one. And we're going to start with Avilokiteshvara because there is actually no better iconic bodhisattva than Avilokiteshvara. So let's return really quickly to our stili, right? Our stili of the great play. So I used this as an example of the life story of the Buddha because that in, indeed is what is, in, is going on in this. But what we didn't really talk about are those figures on the side there, right? In particular, that figure. So this figure is this figure. So I don't know if you caught that. I don't know if you can see the... So first of all, catch the posture in the left hand. So on the right hand side of your screen, but in the Bodhisattva's left hand is a lotus flower and they're right hand is down at their below near their leg facing out right and here you can see that same exact posture lotus flower slight tilt to the side right hand out right so this is a being shall we say bodhisattva named uh where are we at? Padmapani, the lotus bearer. And this image is known as Padmapani because indeed they hold a lotus flower. They are the lotus bearer. This is considered sort of the beginning of the Avilokiteshvara Bodhisattva image. <clears throat> it's debatable whether this is Avilokiteshvara or not. It it, it, it's really a matter of like art history and archaeology to determine whether they're the same. But this Padmapani, here's another Padmapani. You see the lotus flower, you see the gate, you see the hand, right? And also this, this is actually a very old statue. Same hand posture, same lotus flower, but now full lotus posture. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is 
you may have gotten it in your mind that bodhisattvas are standing and Buddhas are seated. Sorry, it's not that easy. So I am going to tonight, you know, do as part of my ongoing series, I want to give you some literacy, some visual literacy of how to read these images. And so, yeah, just because an image is in full lotus posture does not mean it's a Buddha. You have to look a little more carefully in that way. So I've led us to this figure, which again is considered a Padmapani, a lotus bearer. But it is from this image that we get to this image. So we still have a lotus flower. If the Bodhisattva's hand had not been removed or cut off, it would have probably been making that same kind of gesture. But this is this particular image that you're seeing is Avelokiteshvara. And the reason why this becomes explicitly known as Avelokiteshvara is for two reasons. There's sort of two telltale signs of Avilokiteshvara-ness in this image. The one is this being has a tiny Buddha in their crown. And so that's actually two things. That this Bodhisattva has a crown is important. And that there is a little Buddha in that crown is important. That is all not, not always. And in fact, nothing tonight is categorical. It, nothing is always, it, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> the, nothing is categorical in that way. Eight, eight times out of 10, eight times out of 10, if you see an image where there's a little Buddha in the crown of somebody, eight times out of 10, it's going to be Avilokiteshvara, <laughs> but not always. So that's one of the things that starts to happen with this image of Avilokiteshvara, who, by the way, this word Ava Loka Ishvara translates to the Ishvara, the Lord who gazes down upon the world. And the language there is a little problematic as far as like in English to look down on something has connotations that are not implied here. What is implied with the name Avilokiteshvara, the Lord who gazes down at the world? The idea here is, is that this is an embodiment of transcendence. This is the embodiment of the meditative state that now looks down upon the Saha world or the world of suffering in that way. That's what it means to be Avilokiteshvara in that way. And I want to remind you that this is a bodhisattva. In other words, this is a depiction of a being bound for awakening or bound for enlightenment. And in fact, Avilokiteshvara is kind of considered this being that represents that, I mean, basically they're a Buddha. Basically they're a fully enlightened Buddha. They're just right before that in a sense. And so Avilokiteshvara really represents this sort of exalted figure of the almost fully enlightened Buddha. But I want to take a step back to our idea of the Sutra Buddhas and even the idea of the forest dwelling Buddhas, or sorry, Bodhisattvas. Forest dwelling Bodhisattvas and Sutra Bodhisattvas. I, I said earlier, the history of this has, has yet to be written. In other words, was Avilokiteshvara a forest dwelling bodhisattva, meaning a real flesh and blood human being? It might be. 
It's, it's very, 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 very possible that that's true. Avi Lokiteshvara is very much a sutra bodhisattva. In fact, Avi Lokiteshvara has her own sutras. Avi, Lok Avi Lokiteshvara is, is very uh, um, present as a sutra bodhisattva. And it happens that Avi Lokiteshvara is one of the most iconic, one of the most represented bodhisattvas in paintings, in sculpture, everything. So this bodhisattva runs the gambit of all our types of bodhisattvas. The reason why I, I kind of said all of that is I want to make a point about what these images are. These images are sort of meant to be, um, you know, not worshipped per se, but they're meant to be uh, mimicked. There, there, it's the idea of like inspiring one to be a forest bodhisattva, inspiring one to be a bodhisattva, inspiring one to become enlightened. So I want you to know that that's what these images are about, is that inspiring that bodhisattva spirit in that sense. The other thing that makes this bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, in addition to the little Buddha in the crown, it's going to be that posture. And so I can say this, while all bodhisattvas, or how can I say that? It's like a, it's a syllogism, but bodhisattvas can be full lotus, they can be one leg up, they can be one leg down, they can have both legs up, they can have both legs down. But Buddhas are almost always only full crop, full lotus. So let that be known that if you do ever see a Buddhist figure who has their legs up or down, it's definitely a bodhisattva. But if they have them full lotus, you're going to have to look a little more carefully to see. And the, the significance the sign, the significance of this posture that you're seeing here, the significance of bodhisattvas having one leg in meditation and one leg usually on the ground, that actually sort of represents that bodhisattvas are sort of partially in full enlightenment and partially in the world. Whereas bodhisattva, or sorry, whereas Buddhas are entirely removed from the world represented by their full lotus posture. So when you see these images of beings with their legs up or down, again, it's a clue that these are bodhisattvas. The image of Avilokiteshvara then loses the flower. So I just go back real quick. You'll notice this one. We still have the remnants of Padmapani, we still have the remnants of the lotus bearer, but then we move right here. You can't see it, but this Bodhisattva does have the little Buddha in the crown. This Avilokiteshvara has like a proper crown crown. And there we have that posture again. This is what's called the uh, Lila Rajasana the royal ease pose. This particular pose is very associated with Avilokiteshvara. So again, I would say like definitely nine times out of 10, if you see a bodhisattva in this posture, you know, ah, oh, that's Avilokiteshvara. Of course, all of these iconic bodhisattvas make their way to East Asia, make their way to China, make their way to Japan. In Chinese, this Avilokiteshvara is known as Guan Zi Zai, which means the sovereign observer. That's the literal translation of the Chinese, which was how the Chinese translated the idea of Avilokiteshvara. 
what you see on the left is a very Chinese Tang Dynasty Avalokiteshvara image. What you can see here too is that we've even moved a little bit further away from the lotus flower. And also you might notice in this one, which is an Indian um, representation of Avalokiteshvara, even though they're on um, a box, you'll notice there's a big flower in the middle of the box. And so they are still sort of on a lotus flower, even though it's kind of a weird boxy lotus flower. But here we've moved entirely away from the lotus flower image. And this is entirely about the posture, which again, this is that royal ease posture. This is also um, Avalokiteshvara. In Chinese, she's also known as Guan Shi Yin, which means hearer of the world's sounds or hearer of the world's crying or hearer of the world's sorrow. In East Asia, Avalokiteshvara becomes almost exclusively a female bodhisattva. But wherever you see this female bodhisattva, you will see that image of the Buddha in the crown, all right? This particular Avalokiteshvara, that particular Buddha in the crown, uh, actually, before I tell you about that, this is a fully kind of very Chinese version. And by the way, if you notice Guan Shi Yin eventually becomes reduced just to Guan Yin, and that's how the Chinese refer to this bodhisattva is bodhisattva guanyin. Here you see also the little Buddha in the crown, but the bodhisattva has become pretty much completely female in that way. And now you'll notice that the bodhisattva has a vase in her left hand. That's in kind of an interesting twist on the bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. And I want you to know something is you'll often find Avalokiteshvara and her vase in this kind of a situation. So this is a, a triptych, a trinity. This is kind of a classic Buddhist trinity. In the middle is a Buddha. This is actually Amitabha Buddha, the Buddha of infinite life. Um, you'll have to refer to my other talks to know more about the Bodhisattva, or sorry, the Buddha Amitabha. But this Buddha of infinite light or infinite life is, again, nine times out of ten, flanked by two Bodhisattvas. One of them is Avalokiteshvara, and one of them is called Mahasthamaprapta. And what's interesting about Mahasthama Prapta is that, oh, sorry, this is a full depiction of that trinity where you can see them more clearly. Avalokiteshvara on your right, pour, pouring out her vase. The image of the vase is, is her vase contains what is called Amrita. Amrita is a, it's a Sanskrit term term where we get the Greek word ambrosia. Ambrosia is from the Sanskrit elixir of immortality. So remember I just said that this Buddha life of immortality elixir. Are you kind of seeing a relationship there between those two? And then over on the left, we have that Bodhisattva Mahasthama Prapta. And look, she has a lotus flower. And that indeed is the image of Mahasthama Prapta, who means arriving at great strength. And, you know, without getting into too much uh, art history, it is a generally understood sort of thing that the Padmapani, the lotus bearer, sort of splits into these different figures. And the more lotus bearing aspect of this bodhisattva becomes known as Mahasthama Prapta. 
and the more compassionate immortality side of this bodhisattva becomes Avilokiteshvara in that way. So I'm just trying to give you a feel for how these things morph and change over time. All right. Let's go back to our bodhisattva proper. So this is a pretty old image of Avilokiteshvara. Remember that I said that the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara can always pretty much be detected by the little Buddha in their crown? Well, here we have quite a crown, right? So there is definitely this association with Avilokiteshvara and the crown, right? And here we actually have what is known as the Ekadasha Mukha Avilokiteshvara, the 11 headed Avilokiteshvara. This, these 11 heads actually, they correspond to the Bodhisattva path. The Bodhisattva path has these various stages that culminate in Buddhahood. And actually, that, that image of the Buddha in the crown of Avilokiteshvara represents that final stage of enlightenment. And there are 10 stages before that 11th stage of enlightenment. So this Bodhisattva becomes really representative of the entire Bodhisattva path towards enlightenment. But it doesn't stop there. This bodhisattva, uh, here's another 11-headed bodhisattva uh, where you can really clearly see the fully enlightened Buddhahood, a Buddha head in the middle. This keeps going though, and this is the thousand-armed 11-headed Avilokiteshvara. This is a Japanese form of, of Avilokiteshvara where she's known as Kanon. Um, although actually, I want you to know that this multi-armed, multi-headed version of Avilokiteshvara is, it's very interesting because you may, you may associate multiple armed beings with Indian religion. You know, Shiva and Vishnu and Brahma has all these heads. Exactly. The 11 headed thousand armed Avilokiteshvara is a very Indian depiction of enlightenment in that way. What's interesting about Buddhism as an Indian religion, this is the only, in, in quotes like nine times out of 10 only, this is the only Buddha Bodhisattva that you will see with multiple arms and multiple heads. Everybody else is one head, two arms. So again, without 100% certainty, but 99% certainty, if you see a bodhisattva with multiple arms or multiple heads, you can pretty much be sure it's Avilokiteshvara. And the reason why Avilokiteshvara has all these arms and all these heads is there's an interesting way where, you know, Avilokiteshvara is, you know, this bodhisattva of skillful means, this bodhisattva of upaya. And there are many stories of this bodhisattva taking different forms. It, she may have appear as female. She may appear as male. She may appear as an animal. She may appear in all kinds of different ways. And that skillfulness and that ability to appear all kinds of different ways, depending on the need, is represented by all of these different arms that contain all of these different implements, right? Whatever might be needed in that way. And not only that, in Japan at least, actually this happens in, in not just in Japan, but it is still, um, taking place in Japan, if I could put it that way. In Japan and other places, Avilokiteshvara becomes kind of even bigger than the Buddha, like kind of even better or whatever. I don't want to say better, but 
there's a way in which the accessibility to Avilokiteshvara and the efficacy and skillfulness, Avilokiteshvara almost becomes her own religion, kind of, sort of. So, I'll, you know, that needs to be noted to the point where in Japan, there is this famous uh, temple monastery where not only is there the 11 headed thousand armed Avilokiteshvara, there's a thousand representations of the thousand armed 11 headed Avilokiteshvara. So this is the famous Sanju San Jendo, the hall of a thousand and one thousand armed Kanon Bodhisattvas. Um, and by the way, this giant um, structure, this giant building, which is filled with a thousand and one Avilokiteshvaras, was built during, I think, the maybe the Kamakura period or earlier, I forget exactly when it was built, but it was built to create a, a, a kind of karmic force field around Japan to protect them from like Chinese invasion, Korean invasion. And so Avilokiteshvara was and is considered a very powerful bodhisattva. In Tibetan Buddhism, so if I just showed you this and I, I was about to do that, but if, if, so if I were to cover up the name, but I were to show you this image, you might think there's four arms. Michael told me a multi-armed bodhisattva is Avilokiteshvara. And guess what? You would be right. <laughs> Um, in fact, I could give you even more information, which is that if you see just four arms, two in prayer, one with the lotus flower, notice Padmapani is still there, and then one with the rosary, this is called Chenrezig, which is the Tibetan pronunciation of Avilokiteshvara. So this is the more Tibetan version of our bodhisattva. Notice full lotus posture, but still multiple arms. This particular one doesn't have a little Buddha in the crown, but that's kind of not common. Usually there's still the little uh, Buddha in the crown. But here's what happens. And I need to probably start moving this along. So I want you to know that the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, who we've been talking about now, known as the Bodhisattva of Compassion. I mentioned that the Chinese refer to her as the hearer of the world's sorrow or hearer of the world's crying. The story about that name, and it's, it's one interpretation of the name Avilokiteshvara, the story of that interpretation is that when this bodhisattva first developed what is known as the divine ear. So the divine ear is one of the siddhis, one of the supernormal powers that gives you the ability to hear vast distances and also able to hear the subtle realms. The story is, is that when this Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara developed the divine ear, they became acutely aware of everyone's crying, of everyone's sorrow. And the idea is, is that it's, it was at that moment that this Bodhisattva became this kind of great Bodhisattva of compassion, because this Bodhisattva could sort of empathize, deeply empathize with all sorrow. The story is, and by the way, this is just the story. The story is, is that then upon hearing the sorrows of the world, this Bodhisattva shed 33 tears. And where these tears landed sprouted these beings called Tara, little Tara bodhisattvas. And there is a white Tara, 
there is a green Tara. And in fact, there was originally a blue Tara, a purple Tara, a magenta Tara, and there were 33 different colored Taras. Nowadays, you kind of only see the white and the green, but I want you to know that there used to be and still are in cases a variety of color of Tara. This is very um, Tibetan. You don't, re Tara Bodhisattva, you see a little bit in Chinese Buddhism, not so much in Japanese Buddhism. It's kind of a very Tibetan figure. And this Tara is always female. Avilokiteshvara can kind of go either way, depending on the circumstance. Even though she's usually female, she can have a little mustache and be male, again, depending on the need. But these Tara beings are always breasted and female in that way. And actually, if you were to then read this book by Chun Fang Yu, this is the best book on the history of Avilokiteshvara, in my opinion. It's one of the most exhaustive studies. So if you're interested in this Bodhisattva, I refer you to this book. But I will tell you, the thesis of this book is that basically there was Avilokiteshvara and Tara, and Tara looked like this, but when Tara went to China, they didn't know who Tara was, so they just said it was Avilokiteshvara. So there does seem to be a kind of conflation of a few different bodhisattvas. Now, maybe that's just her skillful means. Maybe that's just how it goes. I don't know. But I just want you to know again that the real history, meaning the, the you know, the deep history of these things still has yet to be written, but this is a good starting point for Avilokiteshvara. All right. <clears throat> this is our next Bodhisattva. So this Bodhisattva's name is Manjushri. This is what I call the Bodhisattva of wisdom. And indeed he carries the sword of wisdom. There's a few other bodhisattvas that you'll see with a sword, but nine times out of 10, if you see a bodhisattva with a sword, it's Manjushri, whose name means gentle glory. In this image here, this is a pretty classic kind of Tibetan Indian version of, of Manjushri. Again, you know, bodhisattva, but sitting full lotus. So, you know, again, full lotus is not an indication necessarily of Buddha or bodhisattva. Here, again, it is the attribute of the sword that's the giveaway. But you will also notice that this bodhisattva is holding a lotus flower. But that lotus flower on top of it is a sutra. This is a uh, palm leaf sutra book. So Manjushri is very, very associated with the sutra. In particular, he's associated with the Pranyaparamita sutras, the sutras of great wisdom. Again, this is the Bodhisattva of wisdom in that sense. This is a, um, this is also probably a Nepalese uh, version of Manjushri. You see it again, the sword, you see the lotus flower, He's uh, making the vitaraka, the uh, gesture of reasoning. Uh, you can refer to my other talk on the mudras to know more about that. So here's the thing about Manjushri. Unlike Avilokiteshvara, we don't get a lot of different images of Manjushri. Pretty much he's got the sword, he's got the sutra book, and that's his image. But there's one, there's one aspect to bodhisattvas that you will also not see with Buddhas. The thing that you will see with bodhisattvas is that they are often mounted on animals. And so I didn't include an image of it. I'll have to add one eventually, but Avilokiteshvara rides a dragon. Okay, and so you will often see images of Avilokiteshvara riding a giant kind of dragon or a, dra or a serpent in that way. Manjushri 
rides a lion is and mounted on a lion. This is also kind of a, well, I, I would like to say that it's kind of an, an Indian Hindu thing because it is often the case that uh, Hindu or Indian deities are mounted on different animals. That's kind of a thing. But Hinduism and Indian religion are not the only traditions to have this, right? So there is a uh, cross-cultural tradition of what would be called mounts, different animals or deities or what have you riding different animals. And so again, Avilokiteshvara rides the dragon, whereas Manjushri rides the lion. And in this particular image, um, you can kind of see that royal ease pose, but it's a specific version of the royal ease pose that's very associated with Manjushri. Um, and he also has in his uh, right hand, this is a very Chinese version of Manjushri who they call him uh, Manshulia, right? That's their pronunciation of Manjushri. Um, you'll see that he has what is called a back scratcher actually in his right hand. Um, and even though it is traditionally a back scratcher, it's more of a, uh, like a pointer that a teacher would use in a lecture. And that's because Manjushri is associated with kind of teaching or wisdom. If you ever go to a Buddhist monastery, Manjushri, an image like this is usually the image you'll find in front of the library. He's kind of like the bodhisattva of the library in that way. Um, so he's, that's Manjushri. Again, he doesn't have a lot of um, different iconography and images, but he's very much a sutra bodhisattva, of course. You'll find Manjushri in uh, many, many sutras. And so that's sort of his association. Um, there's not a lot of uh, books on just on Manjushri. The best book on, I guess you would call it the cult of Manjushri is this book by Glenn Wallace, the Mediating the Power of the Buddhas. It's actually about a specific text called the Manjushri Mula Kalpa, which is a kind of an esoteric text dedicated to Manjushri. But in this book, he has sort of his, the history of Manjushri, or at least one of the best ones written, because it has, again, it has yet to be written. So take, take note, you uh, uh, Buddhist studies uh, students, the Manjushri book needs to be written. <laughs> All right. This is our third iconic bodhisattva. I'm starting with his mount, his animal, but this bodhisattva who is Kashidigarbha, whose name means earth store or earth treasury. His name will make more sense in a second. So this is Kashidigarbha. I, I include him, um, He's, there's a certain reason why I include him. He's not the most popular bodhisattva. Um, you'll notice he's riding, well, I don't know what you know, what you think that is, um, but what he rides is, um, well, I'll tell you, it's funny. He rides a one horned dog, a single horned kind of rhinoceros dog being. And actually, if you ever get a hold of a, a, of a Kirin beer, it's a Japanese beer called Kirin, K-I-R-I-N. Actually, that, that beer is named after Bodhisattva Kishidigarbha's animal, of all things. So in Japanese, they call that creature Kirin, and if you get a can of kid and beer, you'll see the one horned hell dog. Um, so this is an, the, the mount, a very interesting mount. This bodhisattva is very associated. Well, he has a few different associations, but iconographically, you can almost always identify him by the staff with the, um, 
what's this called? Um, well, it's a pilgrim staff and it has a name. I for, forget what it is, but you'll notice at the top of his staff, he has, it's um, these rings. These, and what it is, is, is that it's a pilgrim staff that when a pilgrim would get to a designated location, they would uh, pound their staff and it would jingle and it would announce their arrival at each of these pilgrimage stops. So uh, Kishiri Garba, or in Chinese, he's called Di Zhang, or sometimes he's called Di Zhang Wang, the king, earth store king. And that's because this bodhisattva also has a crown, but you will always be able to identify uh, Di Zhang or Kishiri Garba because the crown is a, it always goes this way and is more like a kind of more uh, a crown proper. Whereas Avilokiteshvara's is normally more upright. It's just a very subtle difference in that way. But the other thing about Kishiri Garba is that he is often represented as a monk. And that's where this gets very hard. Because <laughs> if you saw that, you would just think it was a statue of a monk. But the staff with the, the, with the rings and the Mani jewel, the wish fulfilling jewel, that is totally iconographic of this. Uh, in Japanese, he's called Jizo. That's the Japanese pronunciation of Di Zhang, of those characters. And, you know, the story of Kishidi Garba is, and I, I kind of mentioned this uh, uh, briefly or quickly, his, his dog that he rides, it's actually a hound of hell. It's actually a hell dog. And that's because Kishidi Garba is the bodhisattva who has made the vow. And if you remember, I said, he's the bodhisattva of the great vow. Kishidi Garba rides his hound of hell down into the hell realms. So the reason why he is known as the earth store is because he is known to go down into the earth, down into the hell realms. And he goes down there to basically spread the good word to try to get people out of the hell realms. So he is known as the Bodhisattva for those in the hell realms. He is the Bodhisattva of travelers, the Bodhisattva of pilgrims in that way. And the one, the main reason why I wanted to tell you about this Bodhisattva is because if you see this image, in, in Japan, Jizo, even though you'll see a Jizo that looks like this, you will most often see Jizo that looks like this. So if you go to Japan to a cemetery, you will often see the little tiny Jizo and they will have, or he will have the red bib. And you will notice this Jizo, he's got the staff, with the rings, he's got the shaved head of a monk, he's got the wish-fulfilling jewel, but he also has a little child by his side. And that's because Jizo in Japan is the bodhisattva for deceased children. So he is the bodhisattva that looks over the souls of those who leave us too soon. That's his one of his main roles in Japan. Now he's, you know, he's big in cemeteries in general because of his association with the afterlife and the underworld. But in Japan, he becomes particularly associated with, um, with children in that way. So again, it's sort of a very, you know, very special place that I wanted you to know about. So Jizo or Kishidi Garba, it's, he's not the most popular bodhisattva, but he has a very, a very important special place in the tradition. Oh, and uh, if you wanna know more about Jizo, I would recommend this, this book by Jan Bays, 
uh, Jizo Bodhisattva, guardian of children, travelers, and other voyagers. It's again, it's one of the better books that kind of is just about this particular Bodhisattva. And this is going to be our fourth and final iconic Buddha for the evening. So I'm starting with the Bodhisattva on their, uh, their mount. So this is the Bodhisattva that rides the great white elephant, right? Or just the elephant, but it's usually a great white elephant. Actually, even in this picture, you may be able to see that this elephant has six tusks. And that is actually a very important part of the story of this Bodhisattva. So Samantabhadra, let's put his name up. Samantabhadra means, uh, Samanta means ubiquitous, universal, everywhere, entirely. Bhadra means worthy, lucky, good. Samantabhadra therefore means universally worthy, all good, universally good, something like that. So this is the Bodhisattva I said of, he's usually called the Bodhisattva of meditation, but he's really associated with the initial determination for enlightenment. That's the initial movement any one of us makes when we make that vow to achieve enlightenment. So this is the kind of the patron saint or the patron Bodhisattva of, of this vow to achieve enlightenment. And, you know, the determination, the, the drive, the virya, the determination for that enlightenment, yeah, that's, that's represented by this elephant, for sure. But there's one thing you need to know to really kind of understand the elephant here, and it has to do actually with those six tusks. So it is said, if you go all the way back to the Lalita Vistara, to the great play, the Buddha, the original Bodhisattva, it is said, the story goes, that the Buddha's mother had a dream that a giant white elephant with six tusks flew into her right side. And it was from that very right side that the Buddha sprung out, if you remember the, st the stele, right? So this Bodhisattva seated on the white elephant with six tusks, again, really represents that Bodhis the beginning of the Bodhisattva path, right? Being born into this world, ready to be enlightened in that way. So that's kind of the significance of Samantabhadra. He's called Pu Xian in Chinese, which is just the pronunciation of the characters that mean universal worthy. Uh, this is a very old uh, Song Dynasty Samantabhadra. You see, also seated on the elephant. Um, this Bodhisattva also has the little Buddha in the crown. So that's where I said it's like eight times out of 10 going to be Avalokiteshvara, but not always, right? And here is a Japanese where he is known as Fugen. That's the Japanese pronunciation of those same two characters. Same Bodhisattva seated on the elephant. And actually, this posture, the prayer mudra, is very associated with Samantabhadra. So just want you to know that. <clears throat> and there's sort of one, well, there's kind of one last thing that I need to say to wrap this up. And it's about, it's sort of, again, Sam the Samantabhadra, the reason why I wanted to conclude with Samantabhadra is that Although these iconic bodhisattvas are, you know, thousand armed, 11 headed, or on a giant hound of hell, the idea is these bodhisattvas are, you know, they're representative of these various stages of enlightenment in that way. They're representative of the path. 
And although Avilokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, is very, you know, I, I sort of, I, I, I avoided using it, but she is known as the savior Bodhisattva. And that, that's because there are stories about her saving people all the time. So Avilokiteshvara is very much the, the, the savior Bodhisattva in that way. Manjushri is very much the, the Bodhisattva of intellect and study and wisdom and all of that. Kushiti Garba is again very much about like endurance and patience, but in that sense of like undergoing the trials of hell, you know, that, that level of determination. Samanta Bhadra in the sutras, in the, even in the icon, Samanta Bhadra always really represents you like the idea of you the practitioner or you the aspirant there's a way that samanta bhadra is the closest to us in a way and this is very much a part of the samanta bhadra tradition that samanta bhadra is the the hidden buddha with or sorry the hidden bodhisattva inside all of us and so that um, uh, bodhisattva journey, each of our bodhisattva journeys, it kind of begins with that identification with Samantabhadra in that way. Um, so Samantabhadra actually, I don't even have a bad book to, to recommend to you for Samantabhadra, but I will recommend uh, Vasantara's Meeting the Buddhas, A Guide to the Buddhas, this is one of, this is my version here, meaning the Buddhas. This is one of the better one-stop guides for knowing about Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So I would recommend it for anybody that would, you know, is interested in the art and iconography of Buddhism. Otherwise, I'm gonna end with this picture of a bunch of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to remind you that we only talked about four <laughs> of immeasurable, incalculable, innumerable bodhisattvas. <laughs> All right, so that concludes the talk. I know that that went a little longer than I meant to, but I'm happy to answer questions or field comments or insights. Yeah, Tanya. Um, that was awesome. Thank and you. thank you so much. And so I had a question about, um the tibetan um chen rizig yep so i'm not saying it, saying if i'm saying it right but one thing i've often noticed in that one is often um that bodhisattva will have like a it looks like a dead animal purse kind of like if, if you you know kind of like across their body it looks like a, it was maybe like a fox or a squirrel mm -hmm. or something do you know what's up with that nope Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I can tell you broadly, um, you know, remember Chen Rizig is the, yeah, the Tibetan, and you will find much more in the Tibetan iconography, you will find more animal skins, pelts, uh, lion carpets type of stuff. And that gets tricky. Um, there's many, there's a lot of ways in which I was trying to be very careful with this talk to not even venture into the realm of what is called Vajrayana or what is called like more of the Tibetan style iconography. It's kind of a world unto itself. And, and in many ways I avoid it because I don't know enough about it to speak fully about it. Um, so yeah, so. I don't know exactly what those uh, signify. I mean, I could take guesses, but I wouldn't want to take random guesses in that way, uh, but yeah. Yeah, and then, then just one sort of related question. You had mentioned it and those balls that people hold, those are like hmm. wishing stones or something. What did you call them? The Sinta Mani Jewel. The, yeah, so is that a Tibetan, a Tibetan thing or? 
No, because nope. I mean, sometimes like you see them, or, like, I'll, I, like there's like little piles of them. They look like. Yep. So in um, traditionally, those are called uh, a chinta mani jewel, a wish fulfilling gem or a wish fulfilling jewel. What's interesting about them is they they have a, a history outside of Buddhism and they are a part of just Indian culture. They were basically magic rocks. I, I don't want to say that too disparagingly, but the idea is, is that there would be sort of special stones or rocks. Um, according to most traditions, they would be self-luminous. So they would be somewhat uh, luminous. And there's a tradition of basically being able to either that they are already magical or they can be enchanted and become magical and they are they would be a wish fulfilling jewel and people would acquire them and like and like many fetishes a uh, fetish like a lucky's rabbit's foot or what have you people would make wishes and the the gem was considered to grant the wish buddhism takes this idea and puts it in the hand of these bodhisattvas and these Buddhas. And it's not, it, I don't think it should be understood as the Buddha or the Bodhisattva now becomes a wish fulfiller, but there is this idea that, yeah, it's a, it, this is where it gets very, very subtle and very tricky. But basically, the jewel does represent the fulfillment of wishes in that way. And I, I don't want to get too like uh, out, like all over the place, but it's generally understood in a way that if you see a Buddha or Bodhisattva image and they have one of those, you can then direct intention towards it, meaning that image, and it will amplify that in some way. And the other thing that you mentioned, whereas you'll see these tankas or see these images and see the pile of the jewels in front of it, yeah, I, that's related to the mani jewel that they have in their hand or in their lap. But when you see them at the base, at the front of like an image, they're kind of visual offerings. They're like part of the narrative of the image where those are like little offerings that have been made to the image, but they're part of the image. So, Got it. yep. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs>